right, we're glad you guys are here. Uh, whew, let's just open in prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight, God. We thank you for the chance to come and just to dive into your word. And Father, we thank you that every verse and every scripture is uh, applicable for us today and that it, it's meant for us to to correct and teach and, and show us the, the truth and, and to, to shape our lives. And so, Father, tonight as we dive into your word, I pray, Lord God, that we would be open to receive your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I just want to put it out there. I am so excited for next week. Next week is my favorite chapter in Genesis. It is amazing. So we're going to cover next week the second half of four and all of five. But if you aren't convinced yet to uh, take uh, God's word literal, hopefully you will be after next week. So um, don't miss that. All right. Well, quick recap. We saw Adam and Eve and... um, and they had sinned, and, and with that sin brought consequences, and so we were able to look at those last week, and so it was one of those uh, sermons that uh, nobody really wants to hear, but it was good to hear. So there we go. And so we saw that the consequences lasted far beyond uh, a generation. In fact, those consequences are still trickling down today, and we saw that there's sometimes sin that 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 goes far beyond our own lives the things that we allow the things that we do then affects the next generation and so just as a sort of a recap because we've already covered this but we saw that god in the hebrew was elohim and elohim meant ruler so your blank there is ruler ruler and judge the true god and it mainly suggests god's right to govern and rule the world and mankind the way that he created it to be. And so we talked about how Adam and Eve broke the rules. God said, hey, I'm the ruler. I'm the designer. I'm the creator. This is what I created. This is how I want to be. And Adam and Eve went against how he created it to be. And then we saw that it it used Elohim 25 times in chapter 1. Then it switched in chapter 2 to Lord God. And we saw and we saw that the word Lord in Hebrew was Jehovah. Jehovah meaning the existing one, the proper name for God. It is where the Jewish people get their name for God, Jehovah, self existing creator, he who forms a redemptive, your blank is redemptive, a redemptive relationship with the nation of Israel. And so we saw last week that even with the consequences of sin, that God had a plan for redemption for us. And we were able to look at Jesus, that the, that the seed of woman would, would crush the enemy, and, and, and that God already, all the way back there, had a plan for us. And so in Genesis 3.14, <clears throat> uh, we'll, just as a quick recap before we get into the chapter 4. It said, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you were cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live, and I will cause hostility between you and and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And so we saw that redemptive plan for us has already taken place, that Jesus already has a victory. If you're in the spiritual warfare class, we already talked about that we we are uh, uh, in spiritual warfare against an already defeated enemy. And so we know that from that offspring comes Jesus, and he came and struck the head of the enemy and was victorious. The offspring of the woman, we said uh, last week, are those who accept the word of God, accept is your blank, and the offspring of Satan are those who reject the word of God. So accept and reject are your blanks there. And so if you guys remember in um, <clears throat> Revelation how we looked at the letters of to the churches, and we said it was kind of like uh, skipping a stone, how when that stone hit, it just kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going, and, and even though those letters are written to actual churches, that that, that letter still lands on us, and, and it's for us now. And so as we dive into this, we're going we're gonna to see that there's, uh, there's, there's things that happen that have continual impact. And so John 8, 44 says this, You are children of your father, the devil. 
You love to do the evil things he does. He's a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So then I tell you the truth. You just naturally don't believe me. And so they, th- this scripture, they were God's people, but yet they were the offspring of Satan because they rejected God's word. They rejected it. They rejected the truth. And so tonight I want to tell you that the, the seed, which seed you are, is not dependent on the family you came from. I've seen plenty of pastors' kids reject the truth, and I've seen plenty of kids, uh, Pastor Nevin's one of them, who shouldn't have made it and yet is a pastor now at a church. It's all based on the person, whether or not you are going to receive the word of God as truth or you're going to reject it. And so... It's not what family you're born into, but rather whether you are open to the word of God. So let's get into Genesis chapter 4 tonight. And so we see here, chapter 4, verse 1, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. And so I, I think this is interesting. She's like, With the Lord's help, I produced this man. And so it, it doesn't say it was her firstborn. I believe it was. Um, You'll see here as we go through Genesis, it only records the males. It doesn't record the females. But we do know that they took wives that were their sisters. Um, I don't think there was, uh, I think he was the firstborn. Um, but uh, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so some scholars believe that uh, that this, this statement of, oh, with God's help I produced a man, is that the woman believed that the uh, offspring, her offspring that was going to come and be victorious over the enemy had finally arrived. But we know it hadn't. So, all right. Verse 2, later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. And so they're brothers, not twins. I think sometimes people think they're twins. I don't, I think, I don't, I disagree. They're brothers. Um, and we'll see here in a couple chapters, because everyone's like, why do you always read the Apocrypha? That's so weird. There's a couple words that we're going to hit in later chapters that have no meaning unless you read the Apocrypha. <laughs> You're like, I don't even know what that word means. Like, what does that word mean? And the only place that you can find a meaning for it is there. So I like to look at that sometimes just to kind of, I'm very visual. I don't know if anybody else is visual. Like I like to see the picture. Like when I, when I read a passage of scripture, I don't just read it and say, oh, cool story. Like I'm picturing it in my head and I'm thinking, how old are they? And, and uh, how long after the fall of man was this? And like I have all these questions that most people don't really care about. So, but in the Apocrypha, it, t- it records years and weeks. Because people live so long. They live to be 900. So how do, you, how do you keep track of stuff? And so they would record their years and weeks. And then what they would do is a jubilee would, is seven weeks of seven. So it would be 49 years with the 50th being the jubilee year. And so uh, it's recorded. It recorded time broken up in 50-year segments because people live so long. <laughs> If we record a time of 50-year segments, uh, we might not get to segment past segment two. You know, like, just my great-grandma lived to be 104. She barely made it past. So, you know, they broke it down easier to record time. But according to that, Cain was born approximately year 71. And so um, it, that's quite a long time that they waited to have kids. And then Abel was born approximately seven, uh, year 78. And then they had one sister, Arwen, who was about seven years younger than Abel at this time. Which, again, that's not, she's not in Scripture, so do what you want with that. Uh, but I like to paint a picture. So, but they're all pretty young. And so um, when Cain and, and uh, at this time, Cain and Abel are around 20 to 30 years old. But if you're going to live to be 900, you haven't quite taken your wife yet because you're only 20. Does that make sense? So n- no one's taken a wife yet. And... Uh, and so in, in, in uh, the pocket that it talks about, in the, the first year of the third Jubilee, so basically year 101, this takes place. And so verse 2, let's see what happened. Verse 2, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. 
When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. So Abel became a shepherd and Cain became a farmer. So shepherd and farmer are the blanks there. Now this passage of scripture is not which, uh, um, which career choice was better. In fact, well, we'll like take a look at this here. Let's jump ahead to Genesis 9. Genesis 9 verse 1. When God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. All the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food, just as I have given you grain and vegetables. But you must never eat the meat that still has the lifeblood in it. So that that was the that's the first mention of eating meats at all. So here here uh, even though they the fall of man, um, they still haven't eaten meat yet. So if you look at the two career choices, actually Cain's is better because he produced the food they would eat, and Abel produced wool and maybe I don't know milk. I don't know. Can you milk a sheep? I have no clue. So. I'm not even sure what you do with a sheep if you're not going to eat it, you know. And so if you if you look at the actual career choices, Cain's was better. They they needed his career choice to be able to survive. And so, in uh, back to Genesis chapter four, verse three. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel's and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. So it wasn't, it wasn't that God said, what is this, vegetables? Are you kidding me? Which my three-year-old would be like, preach it, Dad, preach it. I hate vegetables, they're the worst. That's not what God is doing. He's not like, seriously, you gave me vegetables? Come on, come on, man. Seriously? That's not what this is. And so Cain's produce, um, if you guys remember, because of the canopy, and we talked about the perfect atmosphere, the canopy hasn't fell yet. <laughs> so his produce is like nothing that makes like the, the county fair Vegetables look pathetic. Like his stuff was amazing. And so, uh, but let's, uh, let's look at it one more time. It says, but when the time came for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops. Some. It, when I was in Guatemala, um, we would go to the, the market and buy food baskets for people. And the vegetables are unrealistically huge. Because the soil there is so good. And that is in a location where there's no canopy. So you got to imagine, like, Cain's offering is like, mm, here you go. You know, like, giant carrot or whatever. But it says, gave some. So let's look, take a look at what did Cain give? Some of his crops. You're blank, there's some. He gave some of it. Maybe it was a last-minute thought. Oh, I forgot. Quick, just throw something in the basket. Let's go. Some of you guys do this on Sunday morning. Just get the kids in the car. Just me, apparently. Okay. Just a last-minute ditch effort. And I want to I wanna challenge some of you, you uh, in the room tonight that are on the worship team. Don't ever let the worship you bring be a last-minute effort where you show up and just happen to play. Some of us are, not me, some of you are very good at your instruments. But that doesn't mean you don't continue to get better to continue to give the best to the Lord. to prayerfully think about the songs we want to do. What song do I want to offer up to the Lord today? I believe it was out of his abundance, your blank is abundance. It didn't really matter. I've got so much. 
The canopy is amazing. I don't know. Grab whatever you want. Just out of his abundance, he gave some of it to the Lord. See, when you give, are you only a giver in excess? Is what you give no big deal because you won't even notice it's gone? In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, remember this, a farmer who plants plenty only, uh, plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get generous crops. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. You know, we, uh, we encourage people to tithe. Um, my paycheck doesn't get any bigger if you tithe more that week. But we encourage people to tithe because of the blessing that it brings you, not the church. There are incredible blessings that, that you can't even fathom. You know, I, I don't know how I've made it this far in my life with what I have, except for to say that we've always tithed. We always give to God what is his. And so, but it, 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 we don't know what's going on here with Cain. We don't know if it was a generous gift in comparison to what he had. Maybe it was nothing compared to what he had. Or maybe he was grudgingly just throwing it in the basket. Come on, get in the car. We got to go. We don't know. And so let's take, but what we do know is what, what Abel gave. So let's take a look. What did Abel give? It says he gave the best, your blank is best, portions of the firstborn lambs. So best and firstborn is your blank. Uh, I apologize. Me and Neji went through and changed. It kept auto-correcting the word able to able. And then it auto-corrected it again. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what to do. So uh, you can change that on your paper. All right. So I, I tried. I really did. All right. So point number one, Abel gave the best, your blank is best, of what he had. Question for you tonight is, are you giving God your best? Not, not are you giving God the same or more than the person next to you. I'm not even talking about money. I'm talking about your lifestyle, the giftings God's given you, your time, your focus, your attention. Are you giving God your best? You know, I, with the, I've got two kids that are wild and crazy. And my wife just gave them both military haircuts, so then it's wild, crazy, and scary at the same time. And, um, but I tell you, like, you know, I might get in the office really early and have a long day, but when I got to come home, I have to put game face on and give my kids my best. And it's not till they go to bed <laughs> that I can be like, thank God we're done. Are we giving God our best? See, there would be a risk involved here. Because Abel gave the best of the first generation of his sheep. This would mean he would have to trust God that the next generation born would be just as good as the ones he gave up. Now, anyone that's a farmer or does cattle would be like, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. You keep the best to produce the best. He, in faith, gave it away. Say, God, it's yours. And so Hebrews 11.4 says, It was by faith that Abel brought more acceptable offering to God and Cain, than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So point number two, Abel gave in faith, not 
out of his abundance. He gave in faith. So what makes it an offering? I want to tell you tonight, it has to do with the heart of the worshiper, whether it be an offering of praise, whether it be an offering of serving your time, whatever it is, it's about the heart of the person that says, I do this for the Lord. I, I had to get my uh, attitude straight. I, I, I'm, little kids are not my favorite, I'm going to tell you. I'm sure your kids are super cute, but I don't love them, okay? <laughs> and I know your kids are just as horrible as mine. Okay, let's just be honest, all right? They're little kids. But I had to get my attitude right, and I said, you know what, God? Like, Crystal needed someone to lead worship in children's church, so now I lead worship every, every Sunday for kids' church. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm starting to love it. <laughs> but I had to get my attitude straight. And be like, I'm not doing, I'm, yeah, I'm doing it for my wife because she needed help. But I'm going to do it for the Lord. And then shortly after, we got asked to lead worship for kids camp next summer. <laughs> so we're going to be practicing all year. <laughs> That's going to be the craziest worship you ever saw. All right. But it's about the heart of the worshiper. How you're doing it for the Lord. Don't give because it makes you feel good. Give because you want to give to him. Verse 6. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain? Why do you look so dejected? Well, you, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. See, Cain is given a choice, an opportunity to do what's right. See, Cain's not confused at why his offering was rejected. He knows. He says, if you reject my words to you, sin is crouching at the door, ready to control you. So let's back up. Offering of the woman are those who accept the word. Uh, the off offspring, sorry. Offspring of the woman are those who accept the word of God. The offspring of Satan are those who reject it. Those who reject God's word are controlled by sin. So sin is your blank. That's a fair statement. See, this is the thing. What is the basis of your belief what is the foundation of your belief it is the foundation of your belief god's word well this is what god's word says so therefore is the foundation of your belief social media the news social norms when you look at what's going on in our nation with our young people a lot of times Things will happen, and I'll be like, I'm not really surprised because I've never seen them not on their phone. Their whole world and foundation for their world is based on a belief system they can't put down. What is the basis of our belief? See, it's not what family you're born into. It's a, it's a choice. In Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wicked ways, O people of Israel. Why should you die? It's a plea from God. Come on, do the right thing. And right is your blank. It's a plea. He's pleading to us. Come on. It's a choice. It doesn't matter what family you were born into. It doesn't matter what, what uh, situation you may be uh, going through at home or in work or whatever else was going on. It's a choice. Come on, people. Do the right thing. I've got a redemptive plan. I just need you to accept the truth. John 3.16 says, for this is how God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
Verse 17, but God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. It's God's plan. He, he, it, it doesn't matter where you've been this week or how bad of a week you had. He's calling to you. Come on. I love you. It's a plea from God. You can be accepted too. I sent my son to die. I've, I've got, I, I took care of it all for you. Come on. So we don't know exactly the problem was with the offering, but we do know that Cain does not accept correction. Number three, Cain did, didn't allow God's word to correct his life. Correct is the blank. He rejected correction. And I believe this is what we're seeing in, in, in the world today is that people will say, well, I, I, I'm a Christian, yet they reject every foundational truth so they can live the lie. And so we always say, be careful. You got to take God's word as truth. We don't allow our lives to change what the truth is. The truth doesn't change. We allow God's word to change our life. In James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce righteousness, God, the righteousness God desires. See, Cain was upset angry because he got corrected and he's not found to be righteous or in right standing with God. If you're in a spiritual warfare class, righteousness is he who is who we ought to be. Goes on in verse 21, it says, so get rid of the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Don't just listen to God's word. Do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You don't see yourself. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. He says, humbly accept the word. Let it shape your life. Let, 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 it, let it produce what God intended in your life. Let it, let it help you become who God intended you to be. And so it says, accept God's word and obey it. Accept and obey. Are you blanks? Cain did not do this. He did not accept correction, and he did not obey And it goes on in, in James 1, or earlier in James 1, verse 13, it says, And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God never tempted, is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires. Whose desires? Ours. Which entices and drags us away. These desires give birth to sin, full actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. The inability to obey will turn into sinful actions, and your blank is actions. You know, this is this is where this is where we were at. We we as a society, we don't want to be told we're wrong. We don't want to be told we need to correct anything. This is my truth, so therefore, I'm right because you've offended me, therefore, you must be wrong. Cain was, Cain was offended. I'm telling you right now. He was offended. 1 John 3.12 says, We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and, had, and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain 
had been doing what was evil and his, bro- and his brother had been doing what was righteous. Why did he murder him? Because his, his actions were evil, but his brother was righteous. The offspring of woman, your blank is woman, will always be at war with the offspring of Satan. Why? Because evil hates being corrected. Evil hates being told they are wrong. It's funny, um, well, it's not funny, but it's interesting to think that uh, Jews and Christians are the most persecuted religion in the world. And I'm not talking about prejudiced. I'm talking about straight out drag you in the street and murder you. In fact, today, it may be more, but today there's 20 plus countries in the nation that openly killed Christians, and it's okay. When I was in Myanmar uh, teaching, we weren't allowed to go uh, t- too close to the border of India at the time because at that time they were putting a bounty on missionaries' heads and just being white, they would kill you and take your head and turn it in for money because nobody asked. See, the offspring of Satan will always be at war with the offspring of the woman. And so Israel has been attacked from all sides for generations by people who want them completely wiped out. If you just look at world events alone, you have to ask yourself the question, Why? There's something spiritually dark going on that only those two are being persecuted. Verse 8, Genesis 4, verse 8. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go into the fields. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And afterwards the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? See, this was premeditated. He had a plan, and God gives Cain a choice. Even after he had killed his brother, he gives him a choice to confess his sin. I don't know, Cain responded, am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No, uh, no longer will the ground yield good crop for you. No matter how hard you work, from now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. It says not only would, will you work hard like Adam's punishment, but never will you have good crops. It is Adam's punishment, but greater. Good crops is your blank. Not only will you leave your home like Adam's punishment, but you will never find another home. It was Adam's punishment, but greater. Verse 13, Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is far too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Homeless is the blank. Anyone who finds me will kill me. This is a really weird statement, seeing as um, there's only three of them alive at this point. There was four, but you killed them. See, not only would he be removed from the presence of the Lord like Adam's punishment, but there would be nowhere for him to go. And we're going to see next week that he actually has to then build his own cities because there's nowhere for him to go. He has to, he has to create a culture away from the rest of the world in order to uh, survive. And so, verse 15, the Lord replied, No, I will, give, I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. God, God marks him. So that people would stay away. So as the population in the world grows, I mean, you figure at that time we're we're gonna look 
uh, I think we already did look at it. We looked at the timeline, like uh, we get all the way to Enoch and, and Noah's dad, Lamech, and, and Adam's still alive. So, so every, all the goings on gets past, everybody knows. And so we're unsure exactly what the mark was, but it was a sign to the, for the rest of his life to stay away. And all this started with not accepting correction. Your blank is correction. Uh, I want to say real quick that uh, um, unlike the, Mor- the Mormons believe, just so you guys know, the Mormon Bible says that uh, the mark that was put on Cain was he had black skin. I'm just going to tell you that's racist, okay? Because the color of your skin is passed down, and the Lord never says, oh, and it's going to get passed down to your kids too, and they'll all know. And actually, when we get to the table of nations, we're going to see where different colors and different races and different people come from. So if you've ever been taught that before, it's a straight lie. This is why you stay away from cults like that. All right. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects. Your blank is corrects. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I'm going to have Ed come up here in a second, and he's going to lead us in prayer tonight. Brittany, if you want to come up. That's what was missing from society today is an inability to be corrected. We're going to end with this verse. Philippians 2.14 says, Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. It says, hey, in, the, in this dark world, hold firmly to this. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, but that my work was not useless, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share in that joy. Are we giving God our best? Yeah, but I don't work at a church. Yeah, but whatever you do, do it for the Lord. Even when I I worked jobs I didn't love, I worked just as hard as I do when I have a job that I do love. Are we allowing God's word to correct us? Are we giving God some of what we have? Or are we giving God the best of what we have? Do we live our lives an offering poured out to the Lord?